All right, welcome everybody to this um, uh, day two alumni session. Uh, I'm your chair, David Officer, those of you that don't know me. And we have some exciting talks this morning after um, you have to put up with me for 20 minutes, so I have to introduce myself. And um, I'm going to be talking about the ACES legacy. So strap in because to talk about the ACES legacy, welcome uh, Professor Diamond. Um, we're going to have to do some pretty uh, fast talking because there's so much to cover. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ACES The Legacy. Um, uh, as I said, it's it's almost impossible to be talking about um, the ACES Legacy without um, and, and, and talk about everybody who's done work. Uh, I think we're going to just talk about some highlights here, even though we'll go through this pretty rapidly. Uh, there's some just amazing highlights. And as you'll see, as we get to the end, um, we've got... Um, We've got a great future, even though uh, the center's coming to an end. So uh, let's proceed. And, and I'm starting here, um, although I can see that uh, you've probably got some of this covered. I'll just turn the pointer off for a minute. It's gonna be easier said than done. All right, we'll ignore that and keep with the pointer, but you've just got the ACES 2020 vision there. This is what we started with, a vision to create the next generation of electrochemical devices to create the preeminent world center for electromaterials and to ensure a world-class training environment. The question is, have we achieved that? Will the ACES legacy reflect that? And the way we set about doing that or the structure we set up to do that was that we would have a concentration over the first three years of the center on electromaterials, which included the materials themselves, modeling, characterization, fabrication, and structure and function. And that was going to overlap over those three years then into the following four years in the themes, electrofluidics and diagnostics, synthetic, synthetic energy systems, synthetic biosystems and soft robotics, um, and overseen by um, this wonderful theme that we had developed early on uh, with uh, Professor Sue Dodd, um, ethics policy and public engagement. And so that was the plan. Um, and what do we need to look at to see if we have achieved that? What is the legacy? Well, one definition of legacy is an account of the things that mattered most, the lessons learned and the values left. So you are making a contribution to future generations. And that contribution, as you can see, was being made by uh, a large bunch of institutions and researchers at those institutions. Um, not all of them were there from the beginning, but um, all of them have been involved. And the, and the bottom five were the, uh, our overseas institutions uh, for our PIs. And what, we are looking, what we've decided to look at in terms of our legacy is to look at our knowledge. What, what legacy knowledge did we create? What did we do with regard to training, networks, facilities, and translated research? Now, obviously, a lot of what we uh, will concentrate on in terms of legacy is knowledge. Uh, but certainly, I guess, as we've heard this morning, um, there's indeed been uh, some effects from our training. Uh, our networks are certainly amazing. And... Um, as are our facilities and translated research. And there's just a brief summary there of some of the things that have come out of the center in terms of the legacy uh, over the last seven years. More than 1,700 papers and 20 patents, but notably, at least 60% of those are international, um, training over 150 postdoc and PhD researchers. And the fantastic thing is that those researchers currently lead startup companies or they're in academic positions or government and industry positions or started their own consultancies and so on. Um, the networks have led to six research hubs and training centers, six cooperative research centers or involvement in those and uh, cooperative research projects and 40 or more um, national and international grants and fellowships. And so that, as you can imagine, that the networks associated with all of those have just expanded ACES capabilities immensely. We now have new facilities in biofabrication, bioprinting and batteries. And uh, when you start to look, and certainly in, in the last couple of years, three years, that we've had incredible um, translation in terms of either licensing, VC investment or industry partner entity uh, developments. Um, we started off well in that regard with uh, the development of Aquahydrix, which I won't mention again. Um, uh, early on in the center, I, I, I guess, coming out of the work in the previous center and have followed that up um, uh, with uh, great work carrying on. Now, I am going to split these into the themes, but in many respects, we will talk about a lot of that legacy work 
under electromaterials. And I'll highlight that by putting up a, a little indication whether it's uh, what theme it's in. And then we'll ha have a much uh, a less um, a, a smaller description of the legacy in the other themes. But electromaterials certainly contributed uh, many things which will carry into the future um, into these uh, four central technical themes, if you like to call it. Um, and of course, electromaterials has some impact on the ethics policy and public engagement theme as well in terms of material supply and those kinds of things. Um, so uh, the sorts of things we were looking at in electromaterials were the electromaterials themselves or reaction centers, structural materials, and um, also developing characterization and modeling and the precise fabrication required to put all those things together. Well, one of our notable standouts is graphene. And the graphene research started with the seminal paper in 2008 shown at the top here, um, where Gordon and, his, um, and Rick Kainer and colleagues uh, start, made one of the uh, uh, first endeavors in process of aqueous dispersions of graphene nanosheets. And this is a, a hugely cited nature nanotechnology paper, over 8,000 citations currently and one of their highest cited papers. And this led us to looking at how we could produce graphene in, in, um, in reasonable amounts in dispersion, producing what we call chemical, uh, chemically converted graphene. And also led Ali, who's shown in the picture here, Ali Jalali as a PhD student, and he talked about this yesterday, to produce liquid crystalline graphene oxide. Um, and the graphene work has led to four patents, two commercializations, and over 140 publications within the center. And this has worked largely within the electromaterials theme. But of course, it's spread over into the uh, SBS theme, as um, I've indicated at the top here, where uh, Ali um, and SBS researchers and uh, Gordon working with his collaborator and uh, ACES AI in Texas and the US, uh, Mario Romero Tech. Tega developed the sutrode, which is basically a, a graphene, soft graphene electrode uh, with a platinum coating, which Mario is now using for amazing work and being able to measure um, the output from select nerves um, that he can um, uh, implant these uh, sutrodes into the body and gain information selectively about different types of diseases. So this will be an incredible legacy as this carries on uh, through the years and undoubtedly um, will uh, become commercialized. Uh, the RCGO or the liquid crystalline graphic oxide also had an effect in the SES program where we started to look at catalysis um, with um, the chemists at Monash and so produced um, some amazing results, some of the best results in terms of uh, this particular case with the porphyrin graphene hydrogel uh, producing an outstanding result. And also um, the same material uh, being sent overseas to Professor Kim in Hanyang University, one of our PIs. And this is just one example of many, many papers that uh, Professor Kim has put out. Um, so um, all, all the while we're doing fundamental research on graphene, we're looking for other graphenes to make. We are able to produce a new type of graphene and the difference being that we're able to now make a, a powder dispersion paste in a dough from this graphene, which we patented in 2019 and has subsequently this patent uh, has been taken over by Sakona Battery Technologies, a startup uh, in Sydney and Wollongong, uh, who, and we're now working on a two year million dollar research contract to scale up the uh, so-called EFG, the edge functionalized graphene, and look at its effect in batteries and thermal conductivity for Sakona. But the EFG um, has further opportunities in, in capacitors and photocapacitors. Uh, John Chen's used it in, in uh, thermocells, so there's been work with other ES, uh, SES researchers, and there's also now significant work again with uh, working with uh, the engineers and the soft robotics theme, but applied to uh, work that's being done by Mario in uh, Texas, again, looking at neural cuffs where we can in fact use a similar uh, electrode to the sutrode and come up with nerves uh, measurements. Well, one of the other notable uh, materials in the center that's really uh, played a huge part virtually in everybody's uh, research is the ionic liquid legacy. Um, and of course, you know there's a legacy when there's a textbook being written on it. Um, and so this will certainly be a book that people will be, will be looking at in the future. And the ionic liquids in the centre cover almost everything you can imagine in terms of ionic liquids and certainly work that has led the world in many of these areas. 
Um, I just put up a few examples of ionic liquid cations and anions there, just to familiarize you with some of those things. But note, uh, the uh, ionic liquid researchers have in EM and in SES have been involved in all sorts of ionic liquids, including polymerized ionic liquids, uh, ionic liquid polymer composites, ionogels, and so on. And the number of applications that these ionic liquids have been involved in has been incredible and will continue to be incredible. And I think some of these are particularly not notable now and will go into uh, translated research, um, but you can see they've been involved in solar cells, actuators, thermocells, and so on. But I, put, I highlight here the synthesis of ammonia, where just uh, this year, there's been a, a, a great publication in science produced by uh, Professor Doug McFarlane at Monash and his colleagues. Um, uh, in looking at the electrosynthesis of ammonia using an ionic liquid electrolyte. And so this has been uh, made a fundamental difference to, I guess, the nitrogen reduction to ammonia uh, to get this high efficiency up. And that has a, an effect that um, uh, will have a major impact in the future. Uh, we've used ionic liquids with, um, with PI Dirk Guldi in, um, in Germany. Uh, this, the ionic liquid's been used in thermocells and um, uh, a lot of the thermocell research uh, that's been done at um, Deakin. Um, and um, I did want to highlight also, um, sorry, moving on from ionic liquids to reaction centers. And, and really, I just wanted to highlight the fact that, you know, in a lot of the materials that have been made in the center, much of this work has involved international collaborators, in particular on the left here, showing work that's been done uh, by my colleague at Attila Moser, CI Attila Moser uh, in ACES with. Japanese collaborators uh, in the EM theme. Uh, enormous amount of work that was done by one of our CIs that, that uh, uh, and we certainly salute uh, Leon uh, Spickier's uh, uh, contribution to the center. He, he's left personally a great legacy and uh, sadly we lost him in 2016, but that has not in any way undermined what he will have left behind in terms of um, his contribution to ACES and, and, the, and the ACES legacy. Again, work with uh, Dirk Gordy on graphene and, and porphyrins, uh, the porphyrin work highlighted here. But I also highlight the fact that uh, Professor Dermot Diamond, who's, who's with us today from um, Ireland, uh, whose work has been amazing in, in a whole variety of areas. And this is just one recent example uh, that we published together in, in uh, Advanced Materials. And this work, again, this and other work that's been done in the center by Dermot and Gordon and um, and uh, both the Irish uh, uh, workers at DCU and others um, uh, is incredible and will certainly contribute to the ACES legacy. Well, characterization has been a fundamental part of the, uh, the center. It's been really important. And we've concentrated, of course, uh, in building up that characterization gear. There's the NMR center that's been developed at um, Deakin and so on, a wide variety of, uh, of characterization gear that's funded by AMF um, and university funding uh, here at Wollongong and at the other universities. But I did, do, did want to draw your attention to two um, examples of characterization we, we have developed here specifically uh, for the purpose of contactless characterization. One of them here, which was a, um, a joint development between the electromaterials theme and the and the uh, electrophilitics and diagnostic theme uh, with Breton and the others down in um, Tassie, uh, Andreas and Gordon and co, um, and Attila here at um, uh, University of Wollongong, and being able to measure conductivity of these graphene fibers and graphene coated fibers, fibers with this developed capacitively coupled contactless conductivity detector. Um, just recently, Andreas has gone, moved on from that work to, to create the ultra uh, image, a, an ultrasonic um, contactless characterization material for uh, soft tissues. And again, this is producing some amazing outcomes. And certainly there's, uh, there's been a number of commercialization options uh, that are being explored currently. And I'm sure this will end up as a, a legacy in, in uh, ACES translated research. In our modeling program, which was really developed in this center um, in, in two areas. One, which was based at ANU with uh, Michelle Coote, Professor Michelle Coote, um, who, who had been working in this area for some time. And, and she joined the center in 2014 and started to produce some amazing outputs, including this one with uh, EM researchers, um, both at ANU and here. 
uh, developing this new field of electrostatic catalysis um, of, re of reactions. And this is the initial Nature publication. And one of those contributors was Naomi Hayworth. And, uh, and I draw your attention to the fact that Naomi uh, was a member of the center from 2014 to 17. And, and uh, she sadly also passed away in 2019. So, so um, I guess Naomi will have also left a legacy for ACES in terms of the development of a new center. We've had some uh, incredible work that's been done at Deakin on the modeling of ionic liquids. So the modeling program has really started to develop. And I think it's in its own right, it will create a future legacy in terms of the development of future uh, centers of excellence and so on. Um, all through this while, we've had this development of a core fabrication capability, both here at the University of Wollongong, uh, at St. Vincent's down in, um, in Melbourne, and at, uh, the University, and at the University of Tasmania. And, and this is where we've been looking at 3D printing, metal printing, plastic uh, printing, and so on, and the printing of biopolymers, printing of metal electrodes, uh, a substantial effort in Deacon and here on, on spinning fibers. Um, this shows where it's getting to now with ceramic printing and so on. And so these are the kind of standard uh, equipment that's being used in a whole variety of projects, as you can certainly see and uh, see as we pass through these slide, sl slides. But I just want to draw your attention to the development of the biofabrication capability. Now where we're not just utilizing commercial based printers, but we're developing our own printers. Three examples here. And this is just expanding like wildfire and no doubt uh, huge translation um, uh, opportunities and uh, underway, some of them, uh, for example, the Excelda pen, which is a device for um, surgical printing of adipose stem cells, the IFIX pen for corneal defects, the 3D Alex uh, printer uh, developed here, along with the Royal Prince Albert Hospital for ear cartilage and, and the, uh, I guess, a significant legacy that ACES will leave in terms of the 3D Ready, a bio platform, an educational bio pr uh, printing platform that will educate the next generation of biofabricators. And this will always, this is uh, um, pretty much a world first, and um, this will certainly leave a legacy into the future. Down in um, uh, Tasmania, where the EFD guys had also started to look at printing of analytical devices, this led to some fantastic results some fantastic papers, but also the development of an online presence in terms of uh, people being able to go and, and and purchase customized analytical devices that is now being run out of UTAS um, in terms of uh, the work that was done in ACES. Uh, as I said before, you know, there's, you know there's a legacy there when you've got textbooks uh, that people want to look at and, and major reviews that have come out. This, this review from the UTAS guys, uh, the EFD uh, guys on 3D printing microfluidic devices and their textbook they put out on 3D printing and chemical sciences. These will, again, keep ACEs in the forefront of, uh, of science for some time to come. So very quickly, I'm just going to go through some of the highlights of the other themes. Electrofluidics and diagnostics um, established a new field of fiber-based electrofluidics. This has had fantastic outcomes in a whole variety of papers. Um, they combined in 2021 that electrofluidics with electrochemistry, and this has led to a provisional patent in terms of looking at uh, how you might put things onto the onto the um, threads and looking at and, and then starting to look at other fields where these things might apply and, and other techniques might apply. Synthetic energy systems, uh, renewables for CO2 reduction, water splitting and oxygen evolution reaction, brilliant outcomes uh, and, and a bunch of patents a bunch of a whole load of funding from arena uh, from woodside and so on in some of these areas which will continue on past the end of the center and most notably this area which started in the latter part of the center in the last few years now there's this as i mentioned before this fantastic science paper that's come out in association with the um with the ionic liquids leading to the development of a spin-out company jupiter ionix which of course will take the aces legacy further in batteries has been amazing developments in terms of sodium uh, oxygen batteries, metal electrode cycling and so on. But uh, perhaps the, the greatest legacy will be the setup of the battery hub, which has just received nine and a half million dollars from the, Vict uh, the Victorian government um, to advance this facility at the Burwood campus. And these bat the batteries that are being produced here will feed into things like the soft robotics project. Um, the soft robotics project has been developing um, 
uh, soft actuators, a variety of uh, forms, and there's been a whole bunch of outcomes from that, including uh, this notable gold medal uh, uh, achievement at an international conference for the uh, team in the soft uh, actuators. Uh, the development of, of piezoelectric and capacitive foam sensors, some great outcomes from that. And then the, and then the elastomeric compliant strain sensors, printable sensors, and again, harking back to the ability to print. And then the development and design and fabrication of a soft robotic hand with these embedded soft sensors, sort of capping off uh, the, whole, um, the whole capability. And this, this uh, soft robotics hand really highlights the ACEs, uh, as everybody's come together, whether it's electromaterials science, cell biologists, electrophysiology, the mechatronic engineers, the uh, EPPE people from the ethical and regular. So back to um, synthetic biosystems. Uh, there's been incredible um, work done in developing um, uh, human neural tissues from uh, stem cells using conductive biogels and printed polymer electrodes, which really came out of this initial work using conducting polymers. And that's led to some amazing devices, uh, international patents, ideas grant that will come through for the future. And this idea of a brain on a bench where you could 3D print layered black brain structures. And there's no question that this is be it's quite an incredible uh, legacy. Um, and again, books coming out on this and associated with the fabrication and the printing. In the ethics policy and public engagement, um, what we see is support for all of these areas in terms of developing approaches to ethics policy for emerging technologies, particularly in the area of health, medical and technologies and robotics and renewable and uh, clean energy systems. And, and there have been some outstanding um, outcomes from these, whether it's associated with artificial organs or whether it's associated with things like the soft robotics. Uh, there's also been uh, incredible work in the ethical supply chains, which have been uh, done together with um, the uh, Electromaterials Group or the um, uh, EPPE Group or the SES researchers and working together to produce some great outcomes and some notable outcomes, for example, uh, as far as going as far, for example, in terms of governance at the United Nations. Well, uh, that brings us to training. As you saw this morning, for those of you that saw that, uh, the Certificate of Innovation Entrepreneurship has made a huge difference to our students, but also things like We've developed MOOCs, Graduate Certificate of Biofabrications, Master's courses, and so on. The ACES Global Research Network. Uh, I don't really need to say anything more than to show you the spread that it's had across the globe. Um, the facilities that have been created, as I mentioned before, the Battery Hub. There's Tricep here at the University of Wollongong, which is really developing all of those printers. A new facility that, that has been developed in Melbourne the ACMD, it's first, Australia's first collaborative hospital-based biomedical engineering facility and so on, that's ACES been primarily involved with. So what is the key to the ACES legacy? Uh, I think we'd all agree that it was collaboration. Um, and it's through the collaboration that the, we've had this impact. And the impact really is that ACES has not only changed the way electrical materials research is done, but demonstrated how to do it better. And perhaps if I can finish with this quote from Winston Churchill, who says that now this is not the end, it's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So it's just time to celebrate, I guess, what ACES has achieved, to thank all of those that were involved, particularly AMP, which has contributed so much uh, to ACES, to all the CIs, PIs, AIs, and all you researchers out there, uh, and to thank you all for listening. Thanks very much. Um, let's move on uh, now to uh, Dr. Cameron Ferris, who's going to tell us a little bit about um, uh, how we got to where we was, and Cameron's currently at Adventure Life Sciences. Cameron, welcome. Um, that was really awesome. I really, really enjoyed hearing uh, hearing all that. It's pretty, pretty cool trip down memory lane. Um, uh, th thank you uh, for for having me to speak, uh, Gordon, Sam, and, and all the organising crew. Um, it's a pretty big privilege to be able to present alongside some some good friends and a lot a lot of mentors for me, and um, to to have the chance to, uh, all, all good, Sam? Can, were you popping up there to, to say something? No, no, all good, sorry. Cool, sorry. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I had to have the, have the chance to celebrate something that I think is really, really worth celebrating, which is ASUS, ASUS legacy. And it's um, yeah, been really, really cool to reflect as I've prepared for today. So so <clears throat> I guess the, the title um, of my talk is, is how did I get here? And to be completely honest, I've, I've got him to thank for the, for the title because <laughs> I was terribly slow in uh, getting back to Sam with the title. So Gordon chose this one for me. So um, thanks for that, Gordon. Uh, and I said, that's a, that sounds like a good title. And, th and then I actually started thinking about the question of how did I get here? And I started having a little bit of a freak out and I was getting flashbacks to, to this book, which uh, I don't know if any of you have read, but I uh, started questioning my, my entire life. <laughs> but, um, in, all, in all seriousness, the question was a, was a helpful prompt to, um, to reflect on the last 10 years or so, and, and particularly to reflect on, on the ACES legacy which really, as I did, just made me filled with um, really immense gratitude for all the ways that my time, I, I could see that my time at ACES has, has impacted my journey since um, to get me to here. And um, so, so firstly, I thought I'd tell you a, a really little bit about what, what here is. So what I've, um, I guess, what I've been up to since leaving ACES. Um, and then I'd really just like to, in the back half of the talk, just celebrate some of the great things um, about ACES. Uh, three, really big things in particular that I'm really thankful for as I reflected on, on my time at ACES. So um, that's what I'll do and hopefully hopefully keep it to 10 minutes or so. Um, so where, where am I now? Um, so I, I'm very lucky to, to lead a, a great team um, of scientists and engineers and developers um, and really incredible people as one of the co-founders and, and COO of a company called Adventure Life Science. Um, we're, we're a team of about 40 odd today. Um, we're growing really quickly um, and backed by some, some really amazing VC funds in Australia. Um, our customers include some, some of the leading research institutes and, uh, and now some top 20 pharma companies in Australia and the US and Europe. Um, we've taken uh, core technology in, in drop on demand bioprinting and we've in, embedded it in firstly a product called Rastrum uh, that enables the scalable adoption of 3D cell culture for, for drug discovery. And we launched that platform late last year and we're now, we're now selling it globally. And we're also developing a platform called Lego uh, in partnership with, uh, with ASUS uh, or, or UOW, Tricep, on an ongoing basis, which I'll talk about a bit later, um, which utilizes the same core technology to enable um, intraoperative delivery of, um, of regenerative cell populations and, and functional matrices um, directly to a wound site <clears throat> to, to trigger tissue guided skin regeneration. And that platforms in, in preclinical trials. Um, so we have a big vision as a company and, and still um, a long way to go, but um, it, we've come a long way since we started in, in 2013 um, with essentially an idea and, and, a, and a research grant. Uh, and it's been a, quite, quite a journey since then. So I'll give you a super quick snapshot on this slide is eight years or so distilled into, into one slide, but a high level um, overview of the journey so far. Um, so in, in 2013, I'd, I'd completed my PhD and, and met um, the two co-founders of InVenture. So um, Dr. Julio Ribeiro, uh, who'd spent most of his career um, developing and, and selling life science tools platforms, um, uh, mo mostly with, with Sigma Aldrich, um, but also um, building his own, his own businesses, uh, had, had um, started a business in, in Queensland for bovine IVF that generated some of the, the cash to, to seed InVenture Life Science uh, and the initial research grant work we did with the University of New South Wales. And then Dr. Aidan Omani, who's our um, CTO and an incredible Irish engineer who happened to be in Sydney with a company called Memjet, um, developing the world's fastest inkjet printers. So he had incredible knowledge in really, really rapid droplet printing. Um, and the, the first thing the company did was, was enter into a, a research collaboration with um, Professor Justin Gooding uh, at the University of New South Wales and Professor Maria Cavallaris at um, the Children's Cancer Institute. And together over a, a four year period or so, a four or five year period developed the, the core technology and, um, the droplet-based printing systems and, and printable biomaterials uh, for, for Rastrum. Um, I, I, during that time, did um, some other things. I was uh, advising to the business, but um, spent some time at EY and in life science investments um, before coming back full-time to the business just before our, our Series A. Um, it's a snapshot of the progression of the platform at the top there, um, the proof of concept in the early days, uh, which was essentially just a, a, a valve depositing some, some inks 
um, through to the Frankenstein, which was really the first kind of um, culmination of, of all the elements of the platform coming together. And that, that's where the platform was when we got our first seed investment from, from Blackbird. So pr pretty ugly looking thing, but um, Blackbird were incredible supporters. Um, then that saw the potential of, of the platform and the vision of what we're trying to do and have been amazing backers um, since then. And, and generally, I'd say I could talk about this forever, but I think the, the venture ecosystem in Australia has changed incredibly in, in the, the kind of eight year period that this slide represents and is, is com completely different now than what it was in 2013. And it's a wonderful thing for, for innovators generally. Um, uh, we, we then got, got more funding in 2018 and expanded the team and the business and, and took the, the prototype from, from the lab into a platform um, that we started working with beta users with um and eventually soft launched the the full commercial platform uh, late last year and have um, now entered europe and the us and, and made our first um sales to, to top 20 pharma companies and and, uh, and are growing quickly and in in, in tandem um we we've uh, initiated the the lego program uh which is the medical device that i mentioned for for skin regeneration and uh have brought together an amazing collaborative crew um, to advance that device, including, of course, uh, UOW and Tricep. <clears throat> um, so a great journey so far, and uh, in, in many ways we feel we're, we're just beginning, but for me, of course, it all, it all started at ASUS. <clears throat> um, so I was very fortunate to do my honours with um, Pro Professor Mark Inhet Panhaus um, at, at main campus in, in Wollongong. Um, where we started playing around with gel and gums and putting carbon nanotubes in, in gel and gum hydrogels to see if we could make them conducting. And uh, re really um, just interesting, super interesting explorative research, um, which you know made me passionate about, um, about research and interested in doing a PhD. And um, uh, the first six months of my PhD, I stayed at, at main campus, but then six months in, uh, six months in, made the transition over to IPRI at the Innovation Campus, which was, uh, that was my view on day one in the middle there uh, when I arrived at my new desk. And um, the, the the kind of mindset coming into that campus for me completely changed um, just the, not just the environment, of course, the physical environment, but the, the people environment, the amount of interdisciplinary work happening there. Um, and a bunch of other things that I'll talk about on the next few slides, but a complete mindset shift, which was, which was um, really incredible for me. And uh, I got, was fortunate to then add two extra supervisors in addition to Mark, so Kerry Gilmore and, of course, Gordon. Um, uh, and, and I feel very lucky to have had three, three incredible mentors uh, in, in the three of them uh, to guide my PhD, which then transitioned into a, into a bioprinting PhD. Um, on bioinks for, for inkjet printing. Um, I was actually, I was at a founders event last night and um, lots of people asking me, how did you get into this kind of cell printing space? And um, it was kind of cool to just reflect on the serendipity of it, of, of how um, fortunate I was to just land at the right place in the right time with some um, incredibly smart minds at ASUS who um, uh, were interested in this bioprinting space and, and to be fortunate to do some um, really interesting research in that world. Um, Top right there is, is graduating uh, with, with Willow Gross and Ali Jalili, many of you will know. I think Ali was the first, first presenter, Sam, I think, yesterday, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so uh, many of you will know Ali. Um, and uh, yeah, just an, an incredible time uh, at ASUS. And I wanted to, as I reflected on that time, there were three really key standout things um, that I just want to cover briefly uh, before I wrap up um which um are, are the three things that i think about most when i think about the legacy of, of my time at asus um and i'm sure many who have been through asus would agree um and the, the first is the um i guess diversity of inputs that i um felt i got to benefit from from my time at asus so i mean david's done a phenomenal job of showing the breadth of research that was happening uh, at asus and um I remember sitting in in lecture theaters, uh, you know, uh, the, the the lecture room there, the Leon Kane Maguire room, um, listening to the talks one one day on on desensitized solar cells, and the next on soft soft muscles, soft robotics, and artificial muscles, and uh, then you know neural stimulation with with conducting polymers, and of course lots of work on three D bioprinting. Just such a breadth of incredible work, and 
I think as a, as a young researcher, having that diversity um, of incredibly smart people across a breadth of fields really just lifted my horizons and um, the way that impacts your thinking. You know, it can be so easy to become narrowly focused in, in a PhD, but um, the beauty of doing a PhD at ACES is that you got exposed to these incredible um, broad fields that really just yeah, lifted your horizons and expanded your knowledge. And I think that diversity of, of, of inputs was, is super key to innovation and, and is a, a major legacy of, of, of ASIS in my mind. Um, the, the other one is that I feel being at ASIS um, uh, meant that there was always a focus on the end, right? The impact of, of research. And again, in PhD and research, we can tend to become you know, very uh, insular or focused on the work we're doing. But um ASIS always had a focus on the end point you know the, the, as a, again as a young researcher you got to engage with clinicians with um uh, industry with community you know talking to um community about the impact of research or the ethics of, of research and um yeah that that focus on the end point uh will always stick with me as as a as a legacy from from ASIS and, and his massive influence of everything I'm doing at Invention Now and, um, and then the third one I just wanted to touch on is, is the importance of enjoying the journey. So when I think about my time at ACES, I think about a lot of really, really fun times. Um, uh, the, the wild rover sticks in my head. I, I almost called this talk the lessons from the wild rover. Um, uh, remember many, many events uh, with, with some great music from Gordon. Um, this is one of my favorite screenshots from a, a, a Kahal O'Connell, of course, from a, a little video that we did uh, once when Gordon returned from Hong Kong and and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, bought a bought a random dragon back. Um, great friends, Troy Lowe and Willow Gross here with one with my daughter Emma, um, and I, I just um, you know again we can tend to become very fixated on the uh, on the destination in research or building a company or whatever it may be, uh, but. Uh, really enjoying the journey is what it's all about. And um, I, I feel like I learned that at ACES, the importance of having fun, uh, doing great work with great people and really enjoying the journey. Uh, and that's really stuck with me. And so th those three things are just what I want to touch on. That's what at the ACES legacy means for me, uh, having really smart, diverse people um, doing work that is focused on impact together and having a really great time along the way. And uh, with those three ingredients as the legacy of ASIS, I don't think you can really go wrong. Um, and I'm still continuing to enjoy that legacy, uh, working with uh, folks from uh, the ASIS uh, network, um, the broad ASIS network uh, in, in the LEGO program. And um, we'll continue to enjoy it for many years to come, I'm sure. Um, Thanks. So that's it. Thanks very much, Cameron. That's uh, brilliant. And I think it reinforces that idea that the real ACES legacy is the people. And you've just highlighted that uh, critically. Now, um, we don't have, I don't think uh, we've got a couple of comments. Gordon says, excellent talk, Cameron. Thank you for your insights. Jeremy, if you could go back, what advice would you give yourself towards the end of your PhD? Um, that's a good question. What advice would I give myself towards the end of my PhD? Um, I, I think to just to keep a super open mind. I mean, um, which, which I feel I did and benefited from that, but I, I'd, I'd do that maybe even more so to, to really lift, lift horizons. I mean, particularly after writing up a PhD when your head's just been in, in the research so deeply for, for, for write up. Um, to just lift, lift the horizons and, and go speak to people, speak to people in research, speak to people in industry and in, in completely divergent fields to get a sense for, um, uh, for what they're doing, what they care about, what impact they're having on the world. And uh, I think, um, yeah, I've said this many times in forums like this, but no, no one, I think if a really smart PhD student asks, approaches them to ask great questions about what they're doing, we'll, we'll turn that, turn that down or, or turn, turn that person away. So just ask lots of questions and, and figure out, uh, how you, you might want to have an impact on the world and um, because there's, there's many ways that that, that can happen. So. That's great. Thanks, uh, Cameron. Um, I don't think we've got uh, lots of congratulations there. Um, uh, Leo's got fantastic to see you again, uh, Ken. I know a lot of current PhD interested in entrepreneurship as a career path. How would you suggest academic students can prepare for this transition or better understand the demands of that path? Go talk to Leo and he can teach you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to cheat and say the same thing I said for the first question, like uh, just 
talk to people talk to like there is an ecosystem in uh the, the the startup world in australia now that didn't exist eight years ago and it's really vibrant and growing and there's lots of great companies david already mentioned many even just from the aces network that are starting to form and, and there's, there's there's many many more so um yeah reach out ask questions reach out to me i'm happy to tell you about the entrepreneurial journey if um if you're interested in it so um yeah well, that's, I think that's a great note to finish on, Cameron. So if people would like to reach out to Cameron and talk about that. Uh, he's offered you that invitation. Uh, thank you once again, and sort of applause for Cameron. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. All right, we'll move on to our second speaker, Professor Ki Gu from the Beijing Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine, um, who's going to talk about his journey from stem cells in China to 3D printing in Australia, and then to bio-inspired engineering. Okay, so thank you, thank you, David. Yeah, uh, as I it is a lambda, I appreciate it for being here. Thank God for the invitation and thank it is support. I'm very uh, fortunate that my journey could be involved in the it is journey. And to a certain extent, it also determined my journey and my career uh, in trust transformation. So how did I transform? You can see these two slides. Uh, for, the, for the left slide is I first uh, come to Australia in uh, 2013. I give my introduction because my, my previous PND is mainly about stem cells and then came to IPRI for materials and study. Um, um, in, in 2017, uh, I graduated. I gave a final talk as a, as a student. Uh, it's smart regenerative medicine. So I have I have transferred my my research interest from stem cells to some engineering methods. Uh, this starts so that uh, when uh, in in 2019 I came back to Australia. Oh, uh, um, Gordon and me, we organized a meeting session of 3D and 4D printed stem cells in, in Brisbane. And then I came back to IPRI to give another talk. It's, it's, it's called Very Inspired Engineering and Very Printing. Very Inspired Engineering is my lab name. So that's this two studies so, so my transformation from stem cells to 3D printing and to um, very fine engineering. In addition to this uh, transition or transformation, um, the scenery in the journey is more important, especially the memory that results from it. From it. Um, for the study, I know 3D printing. I know um, organic uh, synthesis and uh, golden framing for a new field of engineering. It's a uh, fair painting. But the other things are also important, like this, like beer, like fishing, like a friend and a friendship. Uh, this tapping is from golden. I still keep it. Next time when he uh, comes to Beijing, I will open it. Also, some memory of the match code, the, the dark. So, um, back to our story. I take, in, um, I take in memory that I came back to China, starting to operate uh, my own life of very bad engineering based on uh, understanding the mechanism of developmental biology. As we all know, cells are the basic units of the body. Um, the human body is uh, highly um, com complex. It contains so many um, cells, 13 trillion cells, 200 uh, cell types, 79 organs, and uh, 11 centimeters. A series of molecular and cellular events lead to the uh, physiological function. So the, the development of organ is spatial or temporal specific. The first is called the uh, morphogenesis in which um, some structures, some specific structures are organized and uh, generated. It's complex, but it's also orderly. 
there are many cell types that at a micro scale which consists the muscle structure like a larval unit uh, glomerulus. For the micro, for the micromorphology, different tissues are tightly connected and finally organs make up the vital functional setting. So various uh, ways have been developed to stimulate the function, such as self-organization, it's, it's, uh, it's organized, such as the sweet painting to fabricate some uh, individual uh, structures or organs, and then some organ chips technology are used to connect the different tissues in terms of scale, structure, complexity, and multi interaction. Now there are many advances uh, in so many technologies for the self organization or some high tech high technology involved, such as the object and the 3D printing. I don't know to tell it. Suppose we compare the the difference of organs from the natural um, embryo and from the fabrication. There are huge variations. All the bioprinting is used to imitate the pattern seen in, seen in, uh, in vivo. For embryogenesis or organogenesis, it's the combination of dynamic, best tempo, and the multi scale events. And the 3D printing is the direct way to compare different uh, elements together. So it's uh, attractive to transfer stem cells to tissue like products using bare printing technology. The requirement for the live tissue is vascularization and uh, innovation. There are two main comp components for bare printing one is bio ink, and the other is the printer. So uh, we are studied in Australia, we have uh, finished the, the IP, uh, neural stem cell and IPS cell uh, printing. Uh, uh, this was done four years ago, but it's the uh, first time for us to print stem cells. We have tried to different uh, the stem cells in situ to functional um, neural cells. But what we think is that how to control cell fate or how to enhance, enhance function and uh, architecture in 3D, not just uh, different uh, printed cells in 3D. So we did another work to control cell alignment, which uh, collaborated with Perfect One in RCCS. The quality is by uh, supermolecular fiber formed through the it's a polyexpressive complexization process. It's called the IPC by DNA and Hilton printing. This technology hasn't been used in 3D printing, but the methodology and the idea is one direction. So the other uh, critical requirement for the printed uh, organ is vasculature. For the uh, uh, capillary network, uh, it uh, has well uh, cell movement and uh, organization. I mentioned in previous slides, uh, to fabric the complex vessel network, it still needs special um, mechanical properties such as the first pressure, but uh, it also has some uh, requirement for the bioavailability. So for the Cell leading materials it could cell it could support cell survival and uh, vascular and you know, cellular cell could organize and connect connect with each other to formulate the network. And the other thing is that the whole structure should be stable. The cell is a live unit, it could move in the 3D. I saw here the materials. Molecular network density and electricity could influence cell behavior and the morphology, even cell variability. Like the sponge bounded webs, 
the greenery is too dense, and the cell couldn't uh, grow well in it, but uh, the uh, yellow bottom layer is good, and the cell are happy within the structure because it has a very poor structure and has very uh, enough volume for cell growth. So here we tried to reduce the bio ink distance by bringing down the confusion, but it still has some has the, has the stability to keep the printed structure. The bio ink here we use the is mainly based on gamma, which has been widely tested in 3D printing. And uh, the confusion we use is 3%. But originally what makes the in it to improve cell availability, we also designed a small chamber for long-term culture in vitro and uh, the printed construct could be transplanted after PVMS encapsulation. To print a gamma with very low confusion or some other uh, thermosensitive materials with very low storage markers, we asked the, ask the collaborators from Xinyang Institute of the Automation to design the special printing head. It's called the bio head, which has two temperature control modules, and it's more sensitive to control temperature to the commercial one. The capillary, the capability to print the custom mind sparks was very well, um, improved. So the vascular uh, intercellular cells could uh, survive very well in it, and we could also observe the network, the print vessel can have cell attachment. Furthermore, we could also observe uh, UV, uh, uh, the intercellular vertical cell could sprout out the channel. It's, the, it's called the uh, angiogenesis. That's to say that the cell, the, the intercellular cell could uh, form the new tube, could form new capillary. Excitingly, the platform was also used, has been tested in the live tissue fabrication. We have found that in, ex, found the improved expression, uh, expression of uh, large liver specific markers. Now we have tried the uh, uh, implantation. It could also maintain the whole structure and could maintain the stability. This slide summarizes the dynamic model from printing to functionalization. Finally, there, are, there were vascular genesis and ideal genesis uh, occurring in the structure. My another PND students developed one more methodology and the material setting. It's uh, from the collagen hydrogen. It's based on we could control the collagen coefficient to enhance the UV cells and genesis. We can see that you can see that the this red bead could uh, transform, could move the into the into the tube, but uh, this work is still under study. Recently, we have done another um, bio printing work. It is the skeletal mass printing. Uh, this work is what you, the, we want to improve cell. The cell movement or cell alignment during 3D printing. And the uh, skeletal muscle is a, a very good example for the uh, alignment. We can see that uh, at a different figure, the cells could interact with the uh, environment and uh, it could uh, self um, organize the, the structure. And uh, finally, it uh, has a very good alignment. So, but uh, we have uh, tested different uh, conditions such as size, such as different volume. We use 3D printing to, to adjust the volume to control the structure. And finally, we could uh, control the cell dynamic change. And this, this slide summarizes how did we control uh, muscle cells alignment. We can see it uh, because we have to uh, to support to support at the uh, at the two two sides, and the force could uh, 
uh, drive the cell alignment during proliferation and aging. The human body is a very um, complicated and one type of material can't meet the need of the fabrication. So uh, we have developed a series of materials and in summarized uh, uh, in this slide. Because of time limitation, I don't know. So all the materials, such as one, such as, such as this one, with the cell very specific uh, modification to that little cell uh, response. The material has been used in manufacturing a few tissues such as skin and uh, vertical uh, uh, vertical live tissues and scalar muscle with electricity and alignment. Finally, uh, there's one slide I want to show that I'm also now I'm very interested in the uh, interface because uh, interface is where all the all the action happen, such as cell between cell, tissue between cell, tissue between tissue, and the materials between cells, or organ between organ. So I think uh, how to control the, the interface and how to control the cell movement, like the we can see the embryo, embryo development. It has very cell movement. But how can we control the interface? How can we control the dynamic interface? It's very essential for the future um, development. Finally, I want to thank uh, uh, my students and the supporting, and also thank the previous support from ACES. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Keith. Thank you for some amazing work and undoubtedly uh, incredibly complex work. All right. So if we could move on to uh, Dr. Danielle, Dr. Daniela Duck uh, from Swinburne, and she's going to tell us her research about her research journey with ACES. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, so yeah, so my name is Daniela. So I'm a junior postdoc researcher at Codical Labs, and I basically did my PhD at Swinburne uh, at um, the yeah, so the Swinburne node, so under Sir so Simon Moulton uh, supervision. Um, so when I was asked to do this uh, short presentation with you guys, so I kind of reflected a little bit on you know my journey, and I thought I would share it uh, with you all today and how the center contributed to to my training and my present uh, career all right so aces so i um so my journey started a bit like this so after i so i'm from mauritius island so i went on to the uk to do um uh, some studies uh, in biomedical sciences you know, i did my honors and there I was exposed to research uh, in the medical field and slowly I got very interested in that. So then I moved to, um, to France, uh, so where I started my clinical studies. And during those times, so being exposed to patients, um, the environment, so I started getting very interested in innovation in the medical space. And I thought to myself, okay, how can I contribute uh, in the field and get engaged um, and grow that interest and uh, passion of mine. Uh, so I got um, an internship so at the IBMM, so basically developing uh, well, drugs, uh, nanovectors. Uh, and then, so during those times, so I kind of decided then uh, to leave uh, my clinical studies and then do a PhD. Um, yes, so, so yes, I was welcomed then by Simon at Swinburne, and that's a bit how my journey with the centre started. Um, so the first thing definitely that I learned from the centre, and as many people have, you know, so detailed in the previous um, um, talks is really the knowledge and expertise and all the exposure to everything going on in, uh, in well, for me, in the med tech space, uh, so innovation, so um, medical research space. Um, and for me, um, so I wanted to kind of learn a bit about materials, devices coming from uh, more of a medical, uh, biomedical uh, background. 
So, and in my project, so Simon's um, expertise was definitely in materials, uh, electrodes, electrode coatings. Um, so I was involved with this project where we were to develop um, some so photoactive and electroactive coatings for neuronal stimulation. Uh, so optical and electrical stimulation of neurons using uh, so near infrared light as the optical source. And in there, so I basically developed so liquid crystal graphene oxide, uh, whereby you have um, a combined effect. So basically the uh, photothermal effect that you can use to stimulate neurons. And that's basically contributed by the gold nanoparticle and then the graphene uh, component that would uh, help in the electrical stimulation. So then throughout this project, so we developed some electrodes and here you have an SEM image with uh, the gold nanoparticles uh, there. And this is a bit the electrode that we made. So very simple electrode. Uh, so we further then went on to make a device for the stimulation of cells. Um, so whereby in this device, you can fit uh, your electrode and then stimulate through the light, well, by using the light source through here, and then uh, the electrical stimulation through the electrode directly. Uh, so the project was uh, quite successful, I think, uh, in terms of what we made. So this is a picture of our neuronal cells growing on the surface. You can see they're very nicely differentiated. So very happy on there. So it's showing the biocompatibility of our material. And then here, basically, these are some readings um, of the um, calcium imaging that we did to basically see if we can control uh, neuronal function. Um, so yes, so knowledge, expertise and skill. So yes, so I, through that journey, I learned a lot. So not only, you know, the research side of things, techniques uh, that was I was exposed to, uh, but also a lot of other things. So among those, of course, you know, publications and uh, collaborating with people. And we were, um, we actually appeared on advanced healthcare materials um, on the cover page. And this is a bit, the concept of what we're trying, we're trying to do, that is uh, develop uh, this interface so we can uh, mediate uh, optical and neuronal stimulation of neuronal cells here. Um, so yeah, so collaborations and networks, so these things were really crucial. So when I arrived uh, at Swinburne and within the center, so one of the things that really, um, you know, so, uh, amazed me, I guess, uh, was the diversity of, you know, research going out there and how people interact with each other and the different areas and themes that were present within the center. So I was part of the synthetic biosystems um, and also the, uh, oh, sorry, where was it? Uh, so the uh, electromaterials, sorry, as well. Um, and one of the things that to me was really uh, eye-opening so was the involve, involvement of the ethics policy and public engagement group. And I think in terms of research, so we do, I learned that we do have a responsibility in terms of how we produce technology, how we impact people's lives um and also how we source materials being environment conscious uh creating sustainable materials um and all that kind of came within the center and having all these people there and all these things kind of broadens a little bit what i learned and how i see innovations and this was a key thing that i learned and i hope that other people will kind of follow that model as well um, so yeah, so lots of people interacted with the center uh, and that really did facilitate our work. And I think, uh, you know, so I see uh, innovations of companies with like, you know, babies that you try to grow and having a family around that uh, does help in growing and prospering um, both research and, and the people involved. So the people, um, yes, so I met a lot of great people during my journey. Uh, my journey definitely as PhD students, I'm sure all of you know, it's not always very easy, but having the right people around and the support and the knowledge and 
is really crucial, I think, for not just you know the experience of the students and the growth of students, but also the research itself and you know building great relationships. And I guess you know so meaningful relationships are important to have fulfilling lives. That's what I believe. So these were my supervisors, so Prof, uh, Simon, which was really great, uh, great manager as well of the project, while well, helping me to manage the project. Uh, Rob, uh, Paul studied. Uh, Sally MacArthur. Uh, so this bottom picture here, so it's our team, so how we started. So that was one of the first picture we took together. You can see my face was a bit swollen. So when I arrived in Australia, I had quite a lot of allergies, but yet, you know, they were still quite nice to me and were not horrified too much when I showed up with all my allergies there, but now I'm a lot better. Uh, so yeah, so Sean Dilit now who's still working with Simon at this stage. So then slowly we expanded the group. So Simon uh, came and joined us. Uh, so uh, Blanca helped me a lot in terms of you know knowledge in the biophotonic space as well as uh, Paul. And then great friends that I made uh, through the center and without the center, uh, I would never have met these people. So Pauline, Desi, Catherine, Sidra, who actually just got a baby as well a few days ago. And yeah, so awesome people. So other people that I met as well, uh, Eva, Jeremy, Kerry, um, amazing people that really helped me uh, in my journey and, you know, even in terms of advice. Um, so yes, yeah, so the other thing, um, so slowly during my journey, so yes, I loved research, but I also started getting interested in entrepreneurship and innovation. So basically, how do we get uh, innovation out there? And after, so doing the certificate in innovation and entrepreneurship that was at the time so run by Tillman and Attila as well was supporting that um, in the session that I did. Uh, so it was really eye-opening and kind of gave me a bit that drive to start pursuing a little bit more innovation uh, and entrepreneurship. So, so yes, I participated at Swing Band, so at the uh, Venture Cup. Um, so we were one of the finalists uh, there um, uh, with, um, sorry, with a patient garment that we are kind of still developing at this stage uh, that we're not present here. Uh, but yeah, it really gave me that drive and also uh, start getting interested in commercial research. And that's a bit where I'm now. So, uh, so now I'm basically a junior postdoc in a startup company. Uh, called Codical Labs, so based in Melbourne still, and here uh, the innovation so is around so biological computing. Um, so I will always wanted to continue in the neuroscience space, uh, so neuromodulation space, and uh, this company so welcomed me. Uh, uh, so that was August this year. Um, so, and I basically work with them on the neuroscience side and then the hardware design. So basically working on the perfusion circuits here. So, so yeah, so Horn is the CEO and founder, so Andy, and then Brett Kagan, uh, who's a scientific, uh, so the chief scientific officer of the company. And basically in brief, so what we do, uh, so we uh, try to uh, develop, so interface uh, neurons and uh, computer chips, uh, putting it simply, and basically harnessing the adaptability of what um, neurons can give to uh, computing, uh, so silicon chips, and basically making them adaptable. Um, as you can imagine, so for example, autonomous robotics, uh, so having uh, chips that can learn in an environment and adapt to the environment and respond autonomously. So this is a little video here of one of our uh, chips. So, so you can basically access this video here uh, via this link and you can see basically the electrodes real time. So this little pad here, you have a little game. So we put the cells in a game environment and then see how they learn the game and then respond and play the game. So interesting uh, things. So when I arrived here, kind of everything like just blew up my mind every single time and I'm still learning and it's a great journey uh, so far. All right. Um, so yeah, so I guess uh, that's a bit what I wanted to share. Uh, so which is, you know, so as lots of people have said, so the people that you walk your journey are really key, key people, key things that make 
you know, to life a lot better and help you grow as well. Uh, so these are for the people that helped me. Um, so lots of people uh, around. So Daniel, Karen, Will, uh, Justin as well. So keep give uh, a Christian. And so those who know me a little bit better, uh, so I'm also an artist and I wanted to leave you with this painting. Um, so it's titled Growing and I guess that kind of sums up a bit my journey here um, at ACES. So it was definitely a learning journey. So lots of ups and downs and challenges which definitely helped me grow both as a researcher, you know, so gave me the resilience I needed uh, to do what I do now and also the knowledge. And uh, so, yes, I wanted to say a big thank you to all of you um, for being there. Uh, and yeah, and so, so yeah, so thanks, thanks. All right, thank you very much. And now we'll move on to our last speaker, Dr. Matthew Griffith, uh, who's at Sydney University, who's going to tell us about the, um, under the influence, the effect of ACEs on establishing a research career. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to present today. It's been quite inspiring to hear from everyone and you know, see what an amazing legacy ACEs has left behind. And I guess uh, what I'll try and do today in the next 10 minutes or so is just walk you through the influence that ACEs has had in, in my professional research journey. Um, so a quick Cook's tour, I guess, of my career to date. I did a PhD at ACES in 2008 to 2012, and, and that was under Gordon and, and David Officer. And looking there at what I would call molecular electronics or physical chemistry. So we're using um, photofunctional materials, which were semiconductors to try and make electrical devices, and in particular, solar cells. And after that, I had a pretty traditional research career, I would say. I went over to Japan and did a postdoc for a few years, uh, and the roots in that were founded in the collaborations that I made during my PhD with ACES um, and had a blast over there. Um, got brought back to Australia by a wife who demanded I come back from overseas and, and marry her, so uh, ended up in Newcastle um, doing some interesting translation work as a sort of hybrid postdoc commercial project manager, and then had the opportunity to jump back into research as a lecturer in the physics department there, starting up a, a biomedical physics group to follow my passion. And then in 2020, you know, not only for myself, but for the rest of the whole world with COVID, but 2020, we took a bit of a left turn um, and jumped into sort of a professional research management role at the University of Sydney, uh, which has turned into a bit of a hybrid role where I sort of run my own group, but I also have this amazing opportunity to manage the research group of the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research, Enterprise and Engagement at the university. Um, so I thought I'd go back to the start and just reflect on the influence of ACES in my career. And, and I think it's been pretty massive, actually, in terms of the whole gamut of what you want to think about as a professional researcher, what to work on. And, you know, I was fortunate in working with some of the characters you can see on the screen here, David and Gordon, Pete, Simon and, and Attila. And what I found from sort of all of them um, working together was that you really have to be driven by a passion. Um, this career is all about passion and loving what you do. And the other thing is that it's important, important to be creative and, and innovative. If, if there's other people in the world who are already doing what you're doing, you really should think about doing something differently and adding something new. Of course, then there was a bunch of different training in how to be a good researcher. And, and really, one of the key things here that, was, that I learned in my time at ACES was the importance of resilience. You fail, you know, at least in my experience, maybe I'm just not a fantastic researcher, but you fail far more often than you succeed. Um, and just being resilient and keep trying and keep trying and the funding and the results do eventually come. Um, but potentially the biggest thing that I learned was to surround yourself with excellent people. And I guess it's a theme that we've heard echoed over and over again in the last couple of days, this importance of collaboration. But I should spend a moment to reflect here that it was actually quite important in my personal life too. So Back in 2007, I was doing some lab work next to a very cute honours student who uh, sprayed me in the face with a uh, half a vial full of chloroform. Uh, these days, you might call that something else, but back in those days, we called it love, and, and that young lady turned into my wife. So potentially in my life, the biggest impact of ACES has actually been providing me with a loving and beautiful wife. Uh, so once I left ACES, I did this postdoc in Japan. I spent a couple of years over there. And again, echoing this theme of working on things that are really important, I went and found myself a list of, you know, humanity's top 10 problems for the next 50 years. I noticed as I was reflecting on these slides that this photo actually does show 10 gentlemen. I'm not suggesting they're humanity's top 10 problems. It's actually this list down here. 
And as you can see, energy and, in, and the environment focus, um, they're up there pretty high on this list. And so over in Japan, I was working on solution-based solar cells with the idea to provide you know, cheap energy that's widely available for everybody throughout the globe. Uh, and in the two years, I had a lot of fun, both inside and outside the lab, a lot of challenges. The resilience was, was really tested, not knowing Japanese and, and working in a foreign country. And I guess the main research finding was we discovered that these solution processable electronic materials, it's really important that electronic charge and the movement of ions are actually both really important for getting out optimal electrical functionality. And so that was just a little seed that was planted in the back of my mind, which will pop up again in a few moments as I sort of start to think about what to do with an independent research career. And so as my time in Japan was coming to a close and the aforementioned wife was sort of not yet a wife, but was demanding that I come back to Australia and, and do something about that. Um, I found myself coming back to Newcastle and, and teasing out this theme of printable materials to make low cost, easily roll to roll manufactured solar cells. And I had an opportunity again through an ACES connection with Professor Paul DeStore at Newcastle, who's a close collaborator um, of many people at ACES and runs the Newcastle node of AMP. Uh, he offered me a postdoc position in his group uh, with the sort of daunting challenge of come over here and we want to print these materials, but uh, they're organic polymers and they're dissolved in organic solvents. And so if we want to upscale to large scale printing, it's no good if you have a clean and green energy technology, but your factory is pumping out barrels and barrels of toxic chloroform and chlorobenzene and all sorts of nasty solvents. And so in the couple of years that I spent there, as a postdoc, uh, we really engineered this new process, I guess, to take these organic conducting polymers that we all know and love and create these multi-layered device structures which function as a solar cell, but to take the organic materials and to work out a process through colloidal-based chemistry to dissolve them up as organic functional electroactive materials, nanoparticles dispersed in an aqueous ink. So in much the same way that, say, your oil-based paints made a transition through to water-based safe paints, we took these organic materials and we made water-based electrical functional inks. And so now we actually had a pathway to scale these things up. Uh, and it was about this time that I was offered a position as a lecturer at the University of Newcastle. And I had this chat with the head of school at the time who sort of said, well, these papers are all well and good and you can do that and you can chase your funding and your discovery grants and your your ideas grants and so forth but the university of newcastle is you know one of the best industrial collaborators in australia so if you want to really make an impact in this department you should find something that translates and has impact and i kind of thought well you know solar cells printed at large scale translates and has impact and so what we started doing was taking this idea that we'd been pitching to the world of a printable solar cell and turning it into a reality you know testing the proof is in the pudding as they say and so we got ourselves a roll to roll manufacturing plant, which could print these things at tens of square meters a minute. And so you can imagine the potential if you can generate low cost electricity at 10 meters a minute in a factory setting. And what we were able to do, which is really, really exciting journey is to scale these solar cells up from five millimeters squared to over a hundred square meters. And you can see up here on the right, there's this uh, photo of an installation we did for CHEP and if you don't know who CHEP are, every time you see a blue wooden pallet, that was made by the company CHEP. So they use about 1% of the world's entire wood supply. They're quite a large company and quite a large player. And they gave us a roof to test out this technology. And we actually successfully installed 150 square meters of this technology and it works. And so I had the opportunity there to, to develop some project management skills. And off the back of this, Lane Cove Council came to us and said, hey, we like this concept. Um, can you come and put it in one of these new parks that we're developing? And so we reset and we rebuilt um, a new installation, which is now sitting in Lane Cove Council's park. Um, and here we added kind of what I think is a cool feature where we started to double in virtual reality. So the solar cells are generating electricity. And as you go along and you walk under this walkway, you can scan a QR code and it takes you into a virtual reality animated environment which explains how these things are made which is quite cool and so at this stage of my career i'd kind of taken an idea through innovation and through the industry and my passion wasn't to go and do a startup company and try and take this to the world it was really on the research side of things so i went looking for you know what's the next challenge what's the next problem that i can start working on 
And around this time, again, this ACES influence of look for opportunities and work with great people, I went down through this list and we've worked with energy and environment, but I sort of, this one down here at number seven, this disease caught my attention. And when I started reading about, you know, trends in Australian science, I discovered that the Australian government actually spends more on healthcare than it does on defence and education combined. In Australian households, healthcare is actually one of the only things which is systematically growing in time. Um, housing, of course, being the other, but it was a bit too late for me to go and become a tradie and build people houses. And so I started thinking about ways that I could find some applications for the skills that I developed in biomedical science. And at the same time, I had this opportunity to go and run the research um, portfolio for the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research, Enterprise and Engagement at the University of Sydney. And it kind of meant taking a step back from running my own research group. But um, when I went for the interview, I was just blown away by the people and the group. And so within, within this ACES theme and this influence of just surrounding yourself with people of excellence, I decided to take this risk. Um, and I must say it paid off because the first thing that um, this Pro Vice Chancellor, Julie Kearney, for those of you who know her, um, said to me was quite happy for you to start your own research group up on the side if you want to go for grants and you want to publish paper and, and you can fit that in in your in your job description go right ahead uh, and so really i had this amazing opportunity and I, I started thinking about well you know how can these materials port across to biomedical science of course they're electroactive inks so you can collaborate with your friends the chemists and i don't know if pavel's here today but back in my aces day pavel was the guru who sort of taught me a lot of chemistry by um, osmosis, I guess, and tuning the functionality of these materials. Of course, they're still solution-based semiconductors, and if, which means they're inks. And so if I have an ink, I can still print these devices. So I've got light, flexible, and cheap working for me. And of course, as people at ACE has probably discovered, you know, maybe before anyone else in Australia was thinking about this, these carbon-based semiconductors are seamlessly biocompatible with the human body, which in a sense, to a humble physicist like myself is just another carbon-based semiconductor to be figured out. And so there's two areas now that I've sort of branched off into in my own independent research group. Uh, the first one is in radiation dosimeters. So I spent a lot of time with solar cells, which are optical photon detectors, if you like. Um, and, you know, I was sitting in this um, conference for radiation therapy, just blown away by any of you that, that know how radiation therapy works. It's essentially a giant big x-ray laser which rotates in three dimensions around the patient and it's got exquisite technology where there's um, little metal blocking leaves so as this linac they call it medical linear accelerator rotates around the patient the beam can be turned off or shaped or turned on so that for instance if the heart is in the way of the cancer you can shut the beam off so you don't irradiate the heart and rotate around to a better angle you've got exquisite dose delivery you've got exquisite imaging but then they put the patients on the bed and they do pesky things like move or breathe or scratch their nose or you know panic that they're getting treatment for cancer and shift on the bench. And you have this massive dose of x-rays, which now is not being directed at the cancer, but is actually hitting healthy tissue and get horrific injuries. In fact, a quarter of cases actually it reports significant misalignment of the treatment beam with where it was supposed to go. I was actually blown away to discover that there's no way to monitor where the radiation is going during real time. They do this all as a post-processing thing. and By that stage, it's too late. And so we ported these organic semiconducting printed devices across to pixelated radiation detectors. So we're printing them in pixels to get spatial resolution. And we're doing our usual tricks where we optimize the layer structure and we do some clever solution-based chemistry to control the nanostructure and the domain size and polymer crystallinity and these sort of things. But really the exciting thing, which I guess is sort of summarized in these results for those of you that know your medical physics, uh, we showed that we can actually successfully image x-rays with this detector, but we can also use it as a treatment for very, very high energy x-rays. So these little spikes here are pulses of high energy treatment beams that we're detecting, which don't actually influence the beam. So the beam is really high energy, we're taking off about 0.2% of the energy from that beam and we leave 99.8% of the energy behind for treatment efficacy. Um, so that's a really exciting piece of work which are now starting to talk to companies and trying to progress that one from you know, an idea through to industry. And then I guess the other thing that we're really excited about is neural interfacing. So 
Um, what we're trying to do is interface these biocompatible printed semiconductors with sensory neurons, which again, this is where this concept of electronic and ionic charge becomes really important. The bionic world, of course, communicates also by ionic charge. And so if you have a semiconductor that can speak in the language of ionic charge, if you like, you can talk to neurons. And of course, I'd spent a good part of my career at this stage tuning red, green and blue materials um, for solar cells. And if you know anything about how the human eye works, it just so happens that the cones that are responsible for color vision also absorb in the red, green and the blue. And so what we started to work on was printing these water-based nanoparticle inks in red, green and blue selective um, spectral areas, growing um, sensory neurons, so dorsal root ganglion cells that we extract from the spinal cords of rats uh, or retinal ganglion cells, which are extracted from the eyes. So spinal cord for pain management, uh, retinal ganglion cells, obviously for an artificial retina. And then once the neurons were grown, which, which was the first challenge, but over here you can see happy and healthy neurons, they grow, they survive, um, the dendrites extend, so they're functional, which is fantastic. We then patch clamp into these neurons. And this is, of course, our tried and true electrochemistry measurements that we all know and love from our ACES days. But now we're measuring as one of our electrodes the membrane potential directly from a living neuron grown on top of these semiconductors. And then we shine light on them, green, red, and blue, and we hopefully selectively excite in this pixel various different neurons. And we're now at the stage where we're starting to get signals out. So we can print these materials. We have you know, low cost um, biocompatible materials, which are replaceable as functional electrodes and can talk to sensory neurons. And so I guess I've got a little video here on where our vision for this is going. So we should probably um, wrap it up if we can, Matt, because we're uh, a bit over time. Cool. So I've just got, got a very quick couple of slides here. Um, I was just going to reflect on the continuing um, effect of ACES. I've got here. Um, the ideas grant that we got for this work last year. And, and of course, um, we scraped through, we we're right on the cutoff for the funding, but what got us over the line was our innovation and creativity score, um, focusing on you know, this innovation and creativity that was drilled into us as students and our team score, our capabilities. So supporting ourselves with the best and brightest people. Um, there's all the people that have made difference to this work. And I guess just as a final comment, um, so whether it be the personal family or the professional family, um, I think the, the enduring ACES impact is going to be all of those hundreds and hundreds of people that have been trained through ACES um, going out and continuing these lessons and continuing these values that were taught to us um, with the next generation of scientists. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. It was a real privilege um, and looking forward to seeing all the great work that continues to come out of ACES as people move on with their careers. Thanks, Matt. That's fantastic. And um, the messages you've delivered at the beginning, I think, were just spot on for, for students that are coming through and, and who, who are going on to do different things. And you've just you've done amazing things there.
congratulations and um, thanks again. So if you've got, if there's any questions for Matt, please put them in the chat and he can answer them, but we will need to move on. So um, thank you all to all of the uh, four speakers this morning. I think they were just uh, absolutely enlightening about um, what they've done and what's happened in the past and how ACES has influenced them. I think it's just the power of the legacy that ACES will leave. Um, and so please join with me in, in thanking them all. Thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, Gordon, David, everyone. Thanks a lot.